Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. We're very excited to have you here and to um, be giving this presentation. My name is Kayla Rogers, and I am an Education Outreach Coordinator for the Women's Fund. We're a not-for-profit organization located in Houston, and our mission is to provide women and girls with the tools they need to be advocates for their health. So we do this through focused seminars like today's presentation, as well as curriculum-based classes and publications. Our programming and publications are free. If you're interested in learning more, you can visit our website, thewomensfund.org. There you can download PDF versions of the publication or request physical copies as well. So today we are very excited to continue our breastfeeding awareness series with a presentation over breastfeeding basics with Dr. Mizun. Uh, before I turn the floor over, I will give you an introduction. So Dr. Mizun is the managing physician for immunization practices at Kelsey Siebold Clinic. After earning her medical degree in 1982 from the University of Texas Health Sciences Center at Houston, and completing her pediatrics internship at the University of Kentucky in 1983. She returned for her residency at the University of Texas Health Sciences Center at Houston, finishing in 1985. Dr. Mazun speaks Spanish and Farsi, and she again is the managing physician for immunization practices at Kelsey Siebold. Dr. Mazun is a member of the Texas Pediatric Society, Houston Pediatric Association, International Society for Travel Medicine, the Immunization Partnership, and the American Academy of Pediatrics section on breastfeeding. She's also a fellow of the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine. Dr. Muzun is married with two grown children. She enjoys gardening, sewing, tutoring adult study groups, and teaching children's classes. So we have been lucky enough to work with Dr. Muzun before, and so I know this is gonna be a wonderful presentation and I am going to turn the floor over to you, Dr. Mazun. Thank you so much. So um, thank you for that kind introduction. Um, I also work as a newborn hospitalist at Women's Hospital for Kelsey Siebold. So breastfeeding is something I do. Uh, I, I help people with day in and day out. And so this is going to be a very, very practical talk about breastfeeding. Um, I first would like to talk, you can go ahead and switch the side. I know, I know what I look like. So, <laughs> so um, I first would like to talk about why people should breastfeed. A lot of times people really think that um, formula and breastfeeding are equivalent, that breastfeeding is all about nourishment and not about anything else. And, um, you know, the milk in a can is just as good and, and very easy to obtain. But it's really um, not quite so simple. Uh, pregnancy is a unique time in a woman's life where her body is adapting and adjusting to nourish and accommodate a growing baby. But it's also preparing to nourish that baby for the next two or more years. And here in the United States, most people breastfeed for one to two years. But around the world, some children breastfeed as late as four or five years of life. Breast milk co-evolved with us. And by that, I mean that human breast milk is very different from cow breast milk or goat breast milk or any other kind of mammalian milk. Each mammal species has milk that is, um, is specifically for their needs. So cows need to grow very big, very fast uh, to be able to run away from predators and, and uh, survive. And human uh, babies are dependent for a long time upon their parents and don't even start walking until they're a year old. And they don't need to grow very big, but they do need quite a lot of brain development. And, um, and so human milk is very different from the cow's milk, which is the basis of most formulas. And it is what we're meant to eat. And it's the gold standard by which all infant nutrition should be measured. Um, so formula companies spend a lot of time adapting cow milk to be safe for humans, 
but it has, um, but there are a lot of things that are in breast milk that are not uh, in cow's milk to begin with. So they also have to include additives like the DHA and ARA that you see on the cans. And, um, and there are many things in breast milk that they, they cannot even add. So breast milk is um, made of human proteins. So they're easy to digest and unlikely to cause allergies because our human babies bodies can recognize that those are human proteins and don't develop allergies. We don't develop allergies to ourselves. And um, the breast milk also contains prebiotics, which are the um, food that is necessary for probiotic germs in our gut. There's a lot of talk about uh, probiotics and gut bacteria and how that contributes to lifelong health to have the right germs in your gut. Well, that all starts with breastfeeding that starts and most of the information actually comes from the differences between babies who are fed breast milk and babies who are fed formula and what kind of germs are in their gut and what kind of health consequences those lead to later in life. So prebiotics are actually those sorts of sugars and, um, and other carbohydrates that are food for healthy germs food for germs that you need in your intestines and probiotics are those healthy germs. So when you take a probiotic supplement because you were on a course of antibiotics or because you had some intestinal upset and someone recommended it for you, you're actually um, trying to replicate what should be naturally happening in a breastfed baby, which is you're trying to get your gut colonized with healthy germs and get the bad germs to go away. Breast milk also contains immune globulins, the things that mother has encountered in her life that have caused her infection or the vaccines that she's encountered in her life that have protected her from infection. A lot of that immunity passes across the placenta to the baby, but it can also cross the breast milk and uh, protect the baby. So the baby's um, our surfaces, our nasal passages and our intestinal lining are protected by a kind of immune globulin called secretory IgA. And secretory IgA is in breast milk. And so by breastfeeding babies, we are providing them with immunity right at the surfaces, which are first going to come in contact with germs so that they can pr be protected before those germs enter their bloodstream, which is where the placental uh, transmission of IgG, a different kind of immune globulin, can protect them. Breastfed babies, therefore, are really benefiting from their optimal development, the best possible protection from infection, the best possible brain development, the best possible body development, they're less likely to get overweight. Really, breast milk is made for babies, and babies are meant to eat breast milk. I can go to the next slide. So a little more about these um, uh, individual concepts. Um, first, it's, breast milk is a living fluid. It is, um, it's produced when your body, you know, basically takes specific co components out of your bloodstream and also produces specific fats and sugars uh, in the uh, lobules or in the uh, glands of the breast. And breast milk changes throughout the lifespan of the baby or the time that the mother is breastfeeding. So the first milk that mom produces is called colostrum. And um, interestingly enough, there's sort of a health craze about, you know, uh, obtaining colostrum that is cow colostrum or goat colostrum, but that's not gonna be the same protection as human colostrum. And I'm not sure it has any real benefit for adults because um, cow colostrum is to protect cows from things that are on grasses and out in fields, not, not uh, the same sorts of things that humans are generally exposed to. But the colostrum that humans make, that first milk, is preparing the intestines for food. So your intestines come out, they've never been exposed to germs, any germs really, because the placent, I mean, the um, womb is a sterile environment for the most part. And um, they've not been exposed to any foreign proteins. The, the um, placenta and mom's uh, womb are all 
human proteins. So there have been no proteins that could cause allergies and no germs that could cause infection when a baby comes out. And the baby has this large surface uh, of uh, their gut that is now exposed to foreign proteins and to germs. And so this colostrum has a number of functions. It has those prebiotics and probiotics to colonize the gut with healthy germs. It has um, something called glycoproteins, which are these molecules that actually help close the junctions between the cell walls in the intestine. So the, the intestinal wall is covered with uh, hundreds and hundreds of um, little finger-like projections in every millimeter. And, um, and that increases the surface area for absorbing your food. But those cells uh, and villi don't have really tight uh, connections to each other until they're exposed to the colostrum. So the colostrum makes all the cell uh, walls kind of uh, stitched together. Um, because of this glycoprotein, and that prevents large foreign proteins from entering into the intestinal system and then being able to access the bloodstream and cause infection. So one of the reasons that, um, that breastfed babies are less likely to develop, to de develop allergies is because of those first initial effects of the colostrum on the intestine to help mature them. Um, colostrum also um, has the, that secretory IgA, and uh, that amount of secretory IgA continues throughout the, um, as the breast milk changes. And then breast milk changes as the baby grows. So the true milk starts to come in on day two if you've breastfed before, but most women who've, who are first time moms, it'll come in on day three to five. And that milk now has more volume, it has more sugars, it has more protein, it has more fat. And so it's more nourishment than protection, but it is both really, because it continues to have all of those other benefits that I've discussed so far. And that mature milk will change over the months that the baby breastfeeds. So the mature milk of a mother who delivers a preterm baby is actually fundamentally different in its calorie and protein content um, from the mature milk of a mother who delivers a term infant. And actually, as the baby ages, the milk changes to suit what a baby needs at that age. So babies' uh, brains, while they're growing uh, really fast, need a lot of fat for something called myelination, which is a process that the brain uses to, to coat nerve uh, transmission wires, basically, so that they don't short circuit. And so the milk becomes higher in fat as the baby's brain is growing. And then as brain growth slows down, it becomes higher in protein for other purposes. So, um, so this living fluid can't be replicated by formula. Formula is the same that you give to preterm babies as it is to term babies with minor modifications. It's not a living fluid. It doesn't have white blood cells in it or immune globulins or any of these other things that I've talked about. It really just has nourishment for the baby. And it doesn't, that nourishment doesn't change over the course of the baby's life like breast milk does. So these live cells that are in the breast milk actually are one of the things that helps protect the baby um, as well. There are white blood cells, which are the kinds of cells that gobble up bad germs and stem cells that can transform into other types of cells. So they help to, to repair uh, processes that may be going wrong in a baby's intestines. Um, and they can actually um, uh, be absorbed uh, in, in certain parts of the intestines. And so um, just, it's really important for people to understand how unique this milk is to humans and how important it is for humans to have breast milk to be healthy. Um, it's not like formula fed babies are gonna die. They're not gonna be undernourished, but they are not gonna have the same support of their immune system and the same lifelong health um, because, um, formula doesn't provide these, this living fluid. Next slide. I don't think she heard me. Next slide, there we go. <laughs> okay, so breastfed babies we know have fewer infections because of all of these benefits and they're also less likely to be obese. 
Uh, it's very easy to get milk out of a bottle. It's very easy to be overfed from a bottle because bottles can drip milk out even when the baby's not sucking. And, um, and because as you have probably experienced yourself, when you eat really fast, you often don't feel full until you've passed your limit, <laughs> passed where you should be. Um, and then you feel bloated later. And so um, feedings are intended and overall for our health, even as adults, we should eat our meals fairly slowly, chew thoroughly like your grandmother told you. Um, and so bottle fed babies tend to eat really fast and overeat and get overweight. Um, and formula also has uh, really a high amount of sugar in it. Even, um, even formulas that are designed to be as close to breast milk as possible usually contain much more sugar uh, than breast milk contains to make it palatable. And some formulas contain as much sugar ounce per ounce as a can of Coca-Cola does. So that sugar is a concern for overall health as well. And for the overall um, uh, development of things like adult onset I, uh, diabetes or what we used to call adult onset diabetes, which now can occur in childhood. Breastfed babies have fewer chronic illnesses. They're less likely to have allergies for the reasons I stated. Um, they're being exposed to human proteins, not cow's milk proteins or soy proteins. They're less likely to have asthma for that same reason because asthma is often related to food allergies. And they're less likely to have childhood cancer and that's because of the immune system uh, supports. There's less risk of juvenile onset diabetes as well as the adult onset diabetes. And the risk um, uh, related to juvenile onset diabetes is because of the immune system support as well. So that's a type of diabetes where your own body attacks your um, insulin producing cells and it's an autoimmune disease and it's triggered by an immune system that has not uh, been well supported and, and uh, didn't get off to the right start. It's also genetically related. So in families where there is a, a genetic predisposition to juvenile diabetes. Breastfeeding can help um, prevent it, although it won't always prevent it. And then, you know, I talked already about this higher IQ. It's really not so much that breastfed babies have a, a higher IQ. It's really that formula fed babies don't get optimal brain development. So it's not that the breast milk makes you smarter. It's that the formula makes you dumber, <laughs> really. And that's, uh, that's, a problem because uh, that formula cannot be, um, it, it can't contain all of the 300 things that uh, are in breast milk that, that are not in formula because formula has to be sterilized and processed uh, and, and packaged for long-term storage. And um, it, that, that precludes it being a living fluid. Uh, babies who are breastfed also, interestingly enough, benefit from better mouth development. Um, a bottle is usually a kind of a narrow nipple that uh, fits just into the uh, baby's mouth above the tongue and presses against the palate just in the midline. And the palate is part of the skull and, and mouth that is still developing over the first few years of life. And um, it actually uh, widens in a breastfed baby much more than it does in a bottle fed baby because the breast is pressing against the roof of the mouth and it's a wider, broader nipple. And so the palate spreads wider. And so uh, actually babies who are breastfed and, and historically, anthropologically, um, we know this from, from skulls from uh, millennia ago, uh, the, the palate is so much wider that um, malocclusion or having your teeth not line up properly and needing braces is actually almost unheard of in skulls from the distant past, whereas it's pretty common in modern day society, probably because that palate is not spreading wide enough. Um, next slide. So there are also benefits for mom for breastfeeding. Um, pregnancy again has changed mom's body and it's been shown that breastfeeding actually supports mother's return to her pre-pregnancy weight. It supports the return of the uterus to pre-pregnancy size. 
Uh, breastfeeding burns about 500 calories a day. And um, the, the hormones that help produce breast milk are actually um, beneficial in reducing mom's tendency to have postpartum depression uh, as well. And so that's kind of a tricky area. So postpartum depression is a common concern for women and uh, their families that are trying to support them through this um, birth, pregnancy birth and, and uh, early childhood of this baby. So um, there are conflicting studies about depression and, um, and breastfeeding. And it generally, it seems that women who are feeling unsuccessful with their breastfeeding, who don't feel supported, and who are, um, you know, it's just another burden of guilt that they're not, they're not mothering up to their expectations. Those women do tend to get more uh, depressed. But mothers who are supported in their breastfeeding journey, who are assisted to breastfeed successfully, um, who are assisted to make enough milk and to, to know what's normal and what's not normal, those mothers tend to be less depressed because the hormone that, that uh, is produced while mom is breastfeeding, the oxytocin is actually uh, in many ways an antidepressant. It really often makes mothers feel much more cozy and nurtured um, and themselves as well as nurturing the baby. So, so this is what we talk about when we talk about the bonding of breastfeeding. You know, the mother and baby are basically hugging each other and cuddling each other multiple times a day for an extended period. And, um, and that elevates their oxytocin and makes both of them happier uh, in general. And so it's really important to also understand that breastfeeding is going to take time, but some, some of that taking time actually is a benefit to mother. Her body needs rest after delivering a baby and breastfeeding, uh, yes, it requires sitting with the baby for a half an hour or 45 minutes, uh, eight times a day, but that's time that mother is sitting and she's not preparing meals and she's not running around paying bills and she's not um, anxious over other things. And so I encourage mothers to really take that time to enjoy um, the time they're spending with their baby and breastfeeding and to try and make uh, it a restful period for themselves and not uh, try and multitask too much while they're breastfeeding. Breastfeeding is economical and convenient. It, it's uh, much cheaper than formula. It uh, uses your body's own resources and you get to spend your money on salmon and um, fresh vegetables instead of formula because <laughs> formula costs about $2,000 uh, or more for the first year of life for an infant. And all you have to do is basically find a quiet place to sit down and, and put the baby to the breast. So it doesn't take as long to prepare for the baby and the babies um, get it right at the right temperature as soon as, uh, as soon as they are allowed to latch. And for mothers, we know that breastfeeding reduces their risk of heart disease and heart disease is a big killer of women. Um, and and uh, this is, going to reduce their long-term risk of heart disease, adult onset diabetes, osteoporosis, and breast, uterine, and ovarian cancers. So all of those illnesses are reduced in women who have breastfed a baby. Next slide. So hopefully if you're pregnant uh, or if you know someone who's pregnant, you will be able to um, deliver at a Texas 10 step or a baby friendly hospital. And um, uh, this is a picture of, of the hospital I work at. Um, it's important uh, to find a hospital that is going to support your breastfeeding. Because as I said, if you're not successful with your breastfeeding goals, then you are more likely to get depressed. And it's really the first few days that matter the most in terms of being successful at breastfeeding. You need to establish a good milk supply by day seven. You need to establish a good latch by the second or third day of life. You need to be sure that you're um, getting that baby uh, latched on comfortably and well. And um, that's what these steps at the Texas 10 steps and the baby friendly hospital certification provide. So in these hospitals, your baby will stay in the room with the mother. 
And that's so mom can uh, be aware of early feeding cues and put the baby to the breast before they're frustrated and hangry, as people say, before they're screaming and, and uh, difficult to latch. Um, it helps mom recognize when a baby's hungry and learn to respond to other cues for her baby when the baby's upset about you know, wet diaper or uh, is overly tired and needs to sleep, all of those things. So staying in the room with mom can be kind of controversial for some moms. They want that uh, comfort of sending the baby to the nursery so they can sleep. But it's been shown that babies, excuse me, that mothers do not sleep better when the baby's in the nursery. Once you have a baby, and those of you who are already mothers will recognize this, once you have a baby, you have this like hyper alert um, kind of sleep. You sleep, but you're, some, some part of you is listening for that baby at all times. And when the baby's in the nursery, mothers don't sleep well because they don't know what's happening with their baby and they worry about what's happening with their baby. And that's been pretty well demonstrated. So keeping the baby in the room, you know, having the nurse help to settle the baby down so you can all sleep might be helpful, but keeping the baby in the room where you can feed the baby frequently and, and respond to the baby will make you more reassured that the baby's doing well and help you sleep better. Uh, also in a um, baby friendly or Texas 10 step hospital, babies should be put to skin to skin immediately after delivery, whether the delivery is cesarean or vaginal, the baby needs to go skin to skin. That keeps the baby warm. They're usually dried off on mother's chest and then they're left there with a covering over them um, to stay warm. And then babies can actually crawl and find, not really crawl, more like lurch forward <laughs> and find the breast themselves and latch on. And babies who do that in general are going to have more successful time breastfeeding. The nurses and, and doctors at hospitals are often, uh, we're often focused on our tasks and sometimes we'll help a baby get there, but babies left to their own devices will generally find the breast and latch on and feed by two hours of life. Um, the staff at a baby-friendly hospital is educated to support breastfeeding moms. Every staff member needs at least 20 hours of breastfeeding education. So they understand how to latch a baby. They understand what a baby's feeding cues are. They can help you uh, get the baby to the breast comfortably. Babies need to feed as often and as long as uh, they are hungry. So what's interesting is that babies come out waterlogged. They have sugar stored in their liver in the same kind of fat as a hibernating bear. So the day they're born, they're pretty exhausted from delivery just as mother is. And the day they're born, they're not very hungry because they have all of these extra calories packed onto their system and plenty of fluid from swimming and amniotic fluid for nine months. They're really not thirsty either. So most babies on the first day of life will feed about six times and they may go pretty long stretches, six hours or so between feedings on that first day after they've had that first feeding within the first two hours. Um, after that, the second night is really difficult for everybody because the baby, baby starts to wake up and go, hey, I, I'm really kind of hungry and where's the milk? And the milk isn't there by the second night. So the second night, the baby nurses all night long and uh, is, uh, does what we call cluster feeding is pretty frustrating for the families, but that's a normal part of the process. That frequent removal of the colostrum from the breast is what tells your breasts to go ahead and make the mature milk. And the more mother nurses in these first few days, the more milk she's going to make. Mothers who are separated from their babies actually are encouraged to pump eight to 12 times a day in order to make an adequate supply. And mothers who do decide to formula supplement, because they're supplementing with the formula rather than putting the baby to the breast, they actually are going to reduce how much milk they make if they don't also pump. So mothers who choose to formula supplement, we encourage them to pump at the time they're giving the baby the bottle, you know, at, at around that same period so that their body gets the message that the baby's hungry. Formula supplementation should only be, be used when it's medically necessary. Um, meaning, you know, for babies who, uh, whose mother is not making adequate milk by day four, uh, for babies who are, um, 
uh, separated from mother and mother is too ill to come to the nursery to breastfeed the baby or baby's too ill to, to take um, the breast because of breathing issues or whatever. And generally we try to give that formula supplementation without the use of bottles or nipples so that the baby will uh, continue to latch well. So we often may give it through um, what we call a finger feed, where we're sort of very slowly giving it to the side of the mouth with a syringe while the baby sucks on a gloved finger or a pacifier. Um, or they um, are cup fed or spoon fed or tube fed. Next slide. So what should a, uh, the first thing about latching a baby is that um, if, if a woman tells you that breastfeeding is hurting, then something is going wrong and it needs to be addressed as soon as possible. Breastfeeding should not hurt. Um, the, the, um, most of the pain reception in your breast is related to the nipple. Nipples are very sensitive and the baby's jaws should not be clamping down on the nipple to cause pain or even really significant trauma to the skin. You know, if you lick your lips a lot, you'll eventually get them kind of chafed. Um, so sometimes a little soreness is, uh, is normal, but there shouldn't be bleeding, there shouldn't be abrasions, there shouldn't be crushed, bruised nipples. Um, your breast, uh, I'm assuming that everybody can see me, is that true? Yes, no, um, yes. Okay, yes. so your breast works kind of like this bulb syringe, which I'm gonna hold up close to my face. Hopefully you can see it. Um, the, the nipple just has tubes in it. If the baby is really hurting mother, it usually means that they're crushing that nipple. Well, if they're crushing that nipple, nothing is coming through those tubes. The baby actually needs to get their gums behind the nipple and squeeze milk out of the um, breast and suck it through the nipple. And so a pump can only suck and, a, uh, and fingers can only squeeze. So when a mom is pumping uh, for her baby, we actually encourage her to do uh, what we call hand expression after she pumps so that she can get more milk out of her breast. But the baby is designed to get the milk out of the breast. And so the baby's jaws need to be back behind the nipple. And the further behind the nipple that they get, the more milk the baby will get. Um, you want to not be leaning over the baby. You want to lift the baby up to you. So there are all kinds of breastfeeding pillows to help get the baby up to the level of the breast while mom is seated. You don't want to lean over because um, that makes it difficult to see what's happening with the baby's mouth and the breast. And it also gives you back and neck pain. Um, you want the baby to be looking up at the breast. Uh, when we look down, we, it's hard to breathe and it's hard to swallow. Babies need to look like they're drinking from a bowl. They need to have their chin off their chest. They need to be fully facing the breast, a hand on either side. Uh, and we need to support them by holding them behind their neck. So by that, I mean, you know, a baby should not have the back of their head pushed to the breast because then their chin goes down on their chest and they're unable to uh, open wide and they're unable to swallow or, or even breathe comfortably because that also pushes their nose into the breast. So they need to be looking up with a hand on either side, chin off their chest, and we need to hold them around their neck and shoulders rather than the rounded part of their head. Um, and often if uh, breastfeeding is painful, just a few simple changes in the positioning of the baby and in the positioning of mom's hand will make breastfeeding much more comfortable. Pressing between the baby's shoulder blades helps kind of bring them in even closer. If you were drinking from a bowl and somebody shoves you between your shoulder blades, you're gonna kind of open wider and you're, you're gonna get in closer to that bowl. And that helps the baby stay on deeper and get more of that um, breast in their mouth. We want babies to feed until they take themselves off. Often babies will uh, feed for a little while and then they stop and they're still holding the breast in their mouth, but their eyes are closed and mom thinks the baby's asleep. So she takes the baby off the breast and pretty soon within a few seconds, the baby will be looking around like, where did it go? Where did it go? I'm still hungry. And what's really happening there is 
it's like when we chew gum. When you chew gum, you get a cramp in your cheek and you stop for a while and then you go back to chewing when the cramp goes away. So the baby's working their jaw quite hard to get this milk out of the breast um, and they just need a rest. Their jaw just needs a rest. So they'll continue to hold the breast in their mouth and stop sucking. And actually newborns, most of the time they're awake, their eyes are closed. They don't have their eyes open the whole time they're awake. So just closed eyes doesn't tell you a baby's asleep. What tells you the baby is asleep is that their jaw relaxes, they lose the suction and they fall off the breast. Next slide. Okay, so I've kind of talked about most of this. Uh, keeping the baby skin to skin until the first feeding is accomplished is really important. And uh, drinking from a bowl I've talked about. Um, when you're aiming the nipple to the baby's mouth, that's pretty important too. So if you aim the nipple straight at the baby's mouth, all they have to do is make a little O mouth to get the nipple in. And that will mean that the nipple is just right there between the gums. And the first thing that's gonna happen is a pinch. So you want the baby to have a big wide open mouth, gaping wide. And so the way to do that is again, to make sure they're looking up to put that nipple right below the nose and then wait for them to kind of go, well, why is it up there? I'm gonna go get it up there. And they kind of open wide into a yawn and they'll go, ah. And as soon as that nipple crosses the upper lip, that's when you pull them on with their shoulders. So it'll drop right in and go ah, like that. So you wanna wait for that wide mouth. You want the baby looking up and you wanna aim at the base of the nose. Next slide. How can you tell if a baby is getting enough? So again, babies come out waterlogged and, and even a few drops of colostrum are all they really need each feeding. So most um, colostral feeds in the first day are between three and 10 milliliters. So uh, five milliliters is a teaspoon. So two teaspoons is pretty much the maximum for a colostrum feed in the first day. Um, and they're sleepy and they don't they're not going to be unhappy about getting those small feeds because they really still have all of those sugars and fat stores to live on. So um, by the second night, they get really hungry and they start feeding eight to 12 times a day by the second 24 hour period. And that will continue for the first few weeks of life. Um, you should start seeing swallowing at the breast, um, you know, by big deep jaw drops while they're feeding. Um, by 72 hours of life and they become more and more frequent as your milk supply increases. We actually don't want you to get engorged. So women get engorged or overly full of milk if their babies have been formula fed uh, and the milk came in while the baby was sleeping after a full bottle, for example. Um, if the baby is you know, kind of not eating too much on day one, eating a whole lot on day two, really hungry and eating all night long and clustering on the second night. By the third day, when the milk comes in, the baby's like Eureka and wants to feed all day long, is so excited to have that milk that they will nurse very frequently and mothers won't get engorged. So engorgement is usually the result of not getting the baby latched on deeply enough or not feeding the baby um, as often as the baby has requested it. We can also tell whether they're getting enough uh, by their diapers. So uh, we want babies to poop once in the first 24 hours, and then they generally will increase by one poop a day for every day old they are until they're about eight or nine days old. It is normal for newborn babies that are breastfed to poop eight, nine, sometimes 10 times a day. Um, small mustardy seedy stools, but the first stools will be black and the meconium is harder to pass. So early on, just one poop a day is normal on the first day, two on the second day and three on the third day. By day four and five, when the milk is in, they'll start to increase in frequency and the poop will change from black to green and then to yellow. Babies also pee um, and pee tells us that they are well hydrated. There are a number of things actually that tell us that a baby is getting enough in terms of hydration. So we, they have a hormone on board called antidiuretic hormone that keeps them from peeing much in the first day. So many babies won't pee until they're around 36 hours old. And that always makes parents anxious, but it's normal. 
by the uh, by about 48 to, to 60 hours of life or two to two and a half days of life, babies start to pee uh, again once for every day old they are. So they will pee twice on the second day of life, three times on the third day of life, et cetera. And, and that goes up to about eight times a day too, hopefully in the same diaper. So you're not 16 diapers a day, uh, but eight or 12 diapers a day is actually pretty common for a newborn. And um, let's see, and then we want to follow their birth weight. We want them uh, to lose a little bit of weight. If they don't lose weight, we actually worry that their kidneys aren't working very well. Uh, but we want them to gain back to birth weight by day 14. And we don't want babies to lose more than about 10% from their birth weight if they were a vaginal delivery or more than about 15, um, excuse me, 12% if they were a C-section baby. C-section babies, um, moms generally get a little more IV fluid and the babies come out a little overhydrated. And so they tend to lose a little more weight. And mom's breasts should be filling with milk by day, day three or four after delivery. Next slide. I want to talk a little bit about COVID-19 and breastfeeding because there are a lot of women who are just, uh, I'll talk about it in terms of pregnancy too. There are a lot of women who um, have been so um, uh, cautious about what they eat, drink, you know, they change habits during their pregnancy. Uh, everyone generally has a concern about not exposing the baby to something awful. A lot of that comes from the fact that in the past, we weren't so concerned and it was common for women to drink alcohol, for example, during pregnancy. And then we found out that there was fetal alcohol syndrome and that that could really damage a baby permanently. Um, same with cigarettes and, and other things. People didn't used to be concerned very much at all about what they ate or drank during pregnancy. I think now, uh, to some extent, um, Concern is warranted, but over-concern also happens. So um, as far as being vaccinated during pregnancy, we now recommend flu vaccine, whooping cough vaccine, and COVID vaccine during pregnancy. Those illnesses can all make mothers very, very sick. And we know that vaccinating mother against flu, whooping cough, and COVID can help protect the baby from catching those illnesses. We know that immunity crosses the placenta from those vaccines and will give the baby some immunity. Though all three of these vaccines have been shown to be safe um, for the baby. And um, of course, COVID vaccine being relatively new, it's being really, mothers who are pregnant and mothers who are breastfeeding are being followed very carefully. Um, and we are looking for any adverse outcomes uh, in the infants and none have been found to date. So that's none have been found with tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of pregnant women being vaccinated and lactating women being vaccinated. Remember this vaccine was rolled out to healthcare workers early on and many young healthcare workers are female and pregnant or breastfeeding. And so, um, uh, you know, they needed protection against COVID. There was no scientific reason to think that the vaccine could um, get into breast milk or get into the womb or uh, into the placenta. And, uh, and so many people took the vaccine on faith early on, but now we have data to show that it is safe in both um, pregnancy and breastfeeding. Um, it's also important that women who are going to be coming into the hospital not bring COVID into the hospital with them, uh, and that if they do bring COVID into the hospital with them, that, they, uh, that we protect staff and other patients from that illness. So um, most of the hospitals are doing screening again uh, of pregnant women before they're, they come in to deliver to find out if they have had if they have current COVID infection. So it's important if you're pregnant to limit your exposure for at least a couple of weeks. Uh, it, it's important to limit your exposure because you're pregnant and you're at higher risk of illness from COVID, but also you know, recognize that if you have COVID at the time of delivery, um, that uh, there will be a whole lot more um, personal protective equipment <laughs> being used around you and a lot more concern for your health because Pregnant women tend to get uh, more severe respiratory illness from flu and COVID than non-pregnant women. 
So um, limit your exposure, wear your mask when you're indoors, uh, particularly in public spaces such as stores, uh, not necessarily within your home bubble. Um, continue to socially distance and make sure that other members of your family are also protecting themselves when you're in public spaces, um, such as the grocery store. And if you're exposed, you need to quarantine and get tested uh, about five days after your exposure and assume that you're infected and isolate and wear a mask. Uh, and if your baby's already born, uh, wear the mask while you're feeding your baby and do good hand washing. Uh, most babies are not going to be infected, even if mother's infected, um, and can be protected after delivery by mother and family members wearing a mask and washing their hands and keeping distance from the baby when they don't need to be holding the baby. And in order to protect mothers, other family members in particular need to be vaccinated, not just the mom. And um, I already talked about this isolation requirement. So everybody in the household who can be vaccinated should be vaccinated to protect mom. So I have talked myself just about horse. <laughs> and um, I just want you to know that um, I do do breastfeeding um, consultations at Kelsey Siebold. Um, I am not a lactation consultant. I'm actually a physician breastfeeding specialist, which is slightly different. So there are things I can manage that lactation consultants can't, but most of what I do is actually pretty similar to what lactation consultants do in terms of helping people get a better latch and increase their supply by making sure that the baby's emptying the breast well and make sure that the baby's growing well. Um, we have some resources. These, there are some great apps. Um, Breast Beginnings is a free app. It has tips for the first few days. It also has uh, links to great videos, uh, uh, particularly the ones at Global Health Media, which are mentioned over on the other side of the slide, and also from an, a great website called firstdroplets.com. Um, so I, I highly recommend that app. Uh, there's an app called Cofective. It's that's kind of a weird name, and um, this app is actually about supporting pregnancy and supporting breastfeeding. And it is uh, information not only for mother but for grandparents and partners and uh, hospital staff. How everyone can support breastfeeding. Uh, breastfeeding Solutions is sort of a nuts and bolts. Uh, app. It talks about all kinds of odds and ends with breastfeeding, like what to do if you get um, milk blisters or, or blebs on your nipple and what to do if you have an oversupply and lots of, lots of other issues um, for people who are into self-help. Um, and then these websites, bfmedneo.com has uh, got great videos on hand expression, breast massage to uh, increase uh, how much milk is given to the baby and just basic breastfeeding information. Global Health Media is actually the website uh, for informational videos from Doctors Without Borders or Medicine Sun Frontiers. And it is a fabulous resource um, and really has lots of great videos on good and bad latches, skin to skin bonding, the breast crawl that the baby can do right after birth to get to the breast on their own, um, all of that. And elactansia is wonderful for all um, pregnant or breastfeeding women to have um, available because you can look up to see what medications are safe to take while pregnant and breastfeeding. So here's a, a little known secret. The physician's desk reference and the package inserts for most uh, medications will say, that they're not safe or they've not been tested in pregnancy and breastfeeding and that they're not recommended in pregnancy and breastfeeding. And the truth is that um, most medications actually are safe in pregnancy and breastfeeding. And uh, the package inserts and the physician's desk reference, which is actually comes from the package inserts, those are really written to protect the companies, the pharmaceutical companies from lawsuits. <laughs> and so their information is super conservative about pregnancy and breastfeeding. Breast uh, milk does not contain uh, medications that are above about 500 Daltons, which is a size measurement in size because it can't pass into the breast milk. Um, 
There are lots of medications that we take that we have to get by injection. Any medication you take by injection that you can't take a pill for, that's a medication that can't be absorbed through your gut. So if it can't be absorbed through your gut, even if it gets into your breast milk, it's not likely to be absorbed through your baby's gut into your baby's system. So there, there are huge categories of medications that we know are safe simply because of their physical properties, for example. And then there are also places that have really well studied medications to see if they have uh, problems. And most of the medications that can cause problems for babies are seizure medications um, and uh, cardiac medications. And so um, unless you're on seizure medicines or cardiac medications, most antibiotics, for example, are safe for mom to take and safe uh, for the baby to continue to breastfeed. And so I would encourage you to, to, if your doctor just says you need to pump and dump, you need to look at Elactansia and tell your doctor about that resource and, uh, and see if you really have to do that because most of the time you won't have to pump and dump. That's, um, that's just uh, overkill in most cases. So I think I'm pretty much done except for your questions. Okay, thank you so much. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, I know I definitely learned a lot here today and I'm sure that our participants did as well. Since we're a smaller group, if you want to unmute yourself to ask your questions, I know sometimes maybe typing it into the chat may take a while. So you're definitely welcome to do that. If you would like to send your question in the chat, you can do that as well. Um, I will go ahead now and open up the chat box for anyone who wants to submit their questions that way. Um, but I will get us started with the first question. Um, so you spoke about um, the protection that babies get and all of the wonderful benefits um, with breastfeeding. If say a mom wants to breastfeed um, for a few weeks and then maybe things get kind of hectic and she transitions to formula feeding, is the baby still going to get those great benefits or do you have to breastfeed for a certain amount of time? That's a, a, a wonderful point that I failed to make. So I'm glad you asked it. Um, so when a mother is pumping and bottle feeding the baby, some of the benefits the baby won't get. For example, that won't spread the baby's palate. So she'll have to pay for orthodontia later on. <laughs> um, and the milk that she pumps, if it's given fresh, you know, if she just pumped it and then she gives it to the baby in a bottle. It still has all those living cells. It still has all of those immune properties. And, um, and that will be just as beneficial. But because the baby's taking it from a bottle, they may still overfeed and get a little bit overweight. Milk that has been refrigerated uh, and milk that has been frozen, those lose some of those qualities. So some of the cells won't survive freezing. Some of the, uh, the longer something is frozen, the more um, certain carbohydrates and things degrade a little bit. And so some of those benefits will be lost over time. So older frozen milk is less uh, immune supporting than newer frozen milk, and that's less immune supporting than just refrigerated milk. And of course, fresh milk is the best. Okay, thank you. Uh, my next question, you touched on um, a few vaccines um, specifically. Um, are there any vaccines that pregnant women or women who are breastfeeding should not take or should avoid? So we generally encourage women who are pregnant to avoid um, live vaccines, which there are very few of those. So the live vaccines are the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine, the yellow fever vaccine, uh, one of the two types of typhoid vaccine, and one of many different types of flu vaccine are live vaccines. So what we know is we, we tell people to avoid those because, for example, measles and rubella, can, the, the actual infections can cause problems 
with newborns. Oh, and excuse me, chicken pox is another live vaccine. So we know that some of those live viruses can cause uh, problems when a pregnant woman catches with the real chicken pox or the real measles or the real rubella. Um, interestingly enough, there are always going to be people who don't know they're pregnant at the time they get a vaccine. So there's a vaccine, uh, there's a pregnancy registry for all of those live virus vaccines. And uh, no baby has ever gotten congenital rubella syndrome from a rubella or MMR vaccine, for example. So um, they're actually likely to be much safer than, than we treat them as being. Um, but we do recommend that you not get them during uh, pregnancy. Yellow fever vaccine uh, is a kind of an exception with that because if you're in a country like Brazil and they're having a yellow fever outbreak, we vaccinate pregnant women and breastfeeding women. Actually, yellow fever vaccine is the only vaccine that's ever been reported to have a problem with a breastfeeding infant. So all of the vaccines are safe for mom to get, even the live virus vaccines once she has delivered and they're safe for the baby to breastfeed. And we do still give it to, to women who are lactating, uh, the yellow fever one to women who are lactating, but there has been a case report of a baby who got the vaccine virus yellow fever um, from the live virus vaccine. The baby survived and I assume he became immune to yellow fever, but he was sick for a while. And that's that one case report is the only case report of any vaccine causing a problem in a breastfeeding infant, which is why we felt very confident that the COVID vaccine would be fine for breastfeeding women um, to take because it's not even a live virus vaccine. I will say that there have been some reports in my breastfeeding doctors community, but not, not that I've seen elsewhere, of women who got a COVID vaccine uh, while breastfeeding and whose supply dropped for about a week and then came right back up. And those are just isolated reports. Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, that's always good to know. I'm sure you've gotten that question before. <laughs> um, so my next question, oh. Uh, oh, okay. So we have a participant who says, thank you so much. I am a great aunt and as of this morning, or as of this morning, um, so she's now officially a great aunt. And so she's gonna take pictures of the slides and send them over passing along this good information. Oh, excellent. Yay. Excellent. Okay. I think you're um, probably gonna share this on YouTube too, right? So yes. that might be better than taking pictures of each and every slide. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, so you talked a little bit about um, briefly about some of the differences between like you and a lactation consultant. Mm -hmm. So if someone is having um, trouble with breastfeeding, maybe they can't get a good latch. Do you have any, I know you mentioned some of these resources, apps and websites, mm -hmm. um, and then also providers, there are providers at like Kelsey Siebold and, and other clinics and hospitals that would be good resources. So there's a Houston area lactation consultants association, Halcia it's called. And there are also several large breastfeeding consultant um, groups, uh, Bayou City Breastfeeding and Bay Area Breastfeeding are two that come to mind. And a lactation consultants can, uh, can, be, can arrange to come out to your home to help you, or you can go see them in a clinic situation. Um, there's uh, the Lactation Foundation, which is on Loop 610 near Buffalo Speedway, and uh, that is uh, actually a WIC clinic that uh, supports breastfeeding. It's free breastfeeding consultations, um, and that's an excellent place to go as well. Um, there are lots of lactation consultants throughout the city, and lactation consultants are particularly effective at helping babies get a good latch, helping make sure the baby's getting enough milk from mom and offering advice on increasing mom's milk supply and um, you know, just overall breastfeeding success. 
The difference with what I can do is as a physician, I can diagnose things. For example, I can diagnose tongue tie if that's an issue, whereas a lactation consultant actually probably can tell you if the baby has a tongue tie, but she's not allowed to diagnose it or treat it. So I can um, clip tongue ties and I can diagnose tongue ties and I can also uh, prescribe medications and, and give other sorts of medical advice, which lactation consultants can't do um, based on licensure. Okay. Um, are there any particular or specific conditions um, that maybe come to mind or that you see often that would prevent a woman from being able to breastfeed? Yeah, unfortunately, there are some women, um, it, this doesn't totally prevent them from breastfeeding, but there are some women who have insufficient glandular tissue. And usually they have a history that, um, you know, as adolescents, their breasts never really filled out very well. They were sort of, you know, pouchy looking or tent-like looking instead of having a nice round base. And um, those women will tend to make uh, less milk. Many of those women go on to get uh, breast augmentation surgery, breast surgery, and also breast radiation can interfere um, somewhat with breast milk production. But most breast augmentations does not interfere with um, uh, breast milk production unless the augmentation was done because she didn't have very much glandular tissue to begin with. Um, breast reductions can reduce how much milk uh, a woman makes, but the, the real kicker is usually, I mean, you know, there's usually, you're usually able to make some milk and get supported to make a little bit more. It may not be a full supply and, and um, any breast milk is better than none because, you know, you, you can get more nourishment perhaps from the formula if you're not making enough milk, but that immune support that your body can provide for your baby uh, that formula can't provide. So any breast milk is shown to be better than none uh, in terms of the health of your child. Uh, but I, what I was gonna say is the real kicker is if a woman has had um, breast irradiation, um, then uh, sometimes that kills off the glandular cells that would make milk. So that's, that's a more difficult situation to deal with. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so if anyone has any last minute questions, now would be the time to put them in the chat. Um, otherwise, my final question for you, um, I love asking this question, and that is, if you could have all of us walk away from today's presentation, um, taking one message, what would that be? Breastfeeding shouldn't hurt. If it hurts, get help with how you're positioning the baby. Thank you so much. All right, that was a wonderful presentation. Um, we appreciate you, Dr. Mazoon, for taking time out of your day to be here and to provide us with this wonderful information. I hope just like our one participant, um, that other participants will pass along what you learned today um, and share the information with those in your life who you feel may be of benefit. Um, just to wrap things up here, if you're like me and you walk away from a presentation and a few days later you think, oh my gosh, I have a question now, um, you can always email us, email us at healtheducator at thewomensfund.org and we will work to find an answer to your question. I've also included a survey link here. We would greatly appreciate if you would take a few moments to complete the survey. Let us know how we did, what you liked what we can improve on, and different topics that you are interested in hearing about. Our social media pages are here on the left-hand side, as well as our website, thewomensfund.org. Um, we promote all of our upcoming presentations and events on these sites. Um, so if you're ever interested in figuring out what we're up to next or what we have going on currently, you can visit these sites to learn a little bit more. And then next week, we have another presentation with Dr. Mazoon over vaccines and you. So she's going to be talking about um, vaccines and immunization, uh, immunizations. And so we're so excited um, to have you back again with us next week. Oh, okay. So we did end up having one more question in the chat. And it said, okay. how do you supportive doctors... 
uh, or how do supportive doctors like you support breastfeeding? Oh, or how to find supportive doctors ah. like <laughs> that support breastfeeding. Well, um, it, most of the doctors who are really supportive of breastfeeding will either have taken the uh, IBCLC or the lactation consultant exam, and they'll have those initials after their name. And there's several pediatricians uh, and OBGYNs in town who are also lactation consultants. Um, or they will have um, joined the um, uh, Academy for Breastfeeding Medicine, which they'll have the initials F-A-B-M after their name for Fellow of the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine. And um, there, I know there are some OB-GYNs uh, in town. I'm, I may be the only pediatrician in town so far with that designation, although I've encouraged several other people to try and, and go for that. Um, so uh, I would initially, you know, try and find a doctor who uh, has the IBCLC designation because that's more common. And you can go actually to the uh, Houston Area Lactation Consultants Association and some of those will, uh, doctors will be on there. And you can also um, go to uh, the, the website for the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine is, um, bfmed.org and uh, they have uh, you know lists of people across the country that you can or actually around the world um, that are uh, breastfeeding medicine physicians. That's awesome. uh, you might also maybe insurance could be able to help you out in your search as well. Um, mm -hmm. If you call, I know they've helped me find different physicians um, when I needed that. Um, but thank you again, Dr. Mizun. We look forward to seeing you next week. And thank you again, everyone, for joining us. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.